Okay, so hey guys, and welcome back to another predictions video. And in today's video, I'm going to be predicting the Perturbia versus a Bivol fight. And so, if you're new around here and you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. Like the video if you do indeed like the video, and let's get straight into it. So, of course, this is the return of another Riyadh season event, another a huge event, and you know, just a, a couple of weeks after the Joshua versus Dubois event, which was an, in itself a huge event, we're now back with another one, and Perturbia versus Bivol is probably arguably the biggest 50-50 we have around in boxing at the moment on paper and probably the best fight we do have in boxing at the moment and you know going into this fight Baterbiev is 20-0 with 20 KOs and Bivol is 23-0 with 12 KOs. This fight is for the IBF, IBO, WBC, WBO and WBA World Light Heavyweight titles so undisputed light heavyweight titles are on the line. Turbio's last fight was a win via TKO in round 7 versus Smith, and Bivol's last fight was a win via TKO in round 6 versus Zinad. But Turbiev is 39 and Bivol is 32, and to speak more about what I've just been saying, like I mentioned, all the titles on the, on the line, the undisputed, I mean, with a fight of this magnitude to have all the belts on the line, I feel like it's only fair realistically, and they're both coming off pretty much just destructive performances and obviously this fight was meant to take place instead of the Zinad fight for Bivol but uh, Baterbiev had uh, got injured, had a bit of time out due to that and so of course he's going to be coming back from that so it's going to be interesting to see how he is going to be dealing with that. I'm pretty sure he may have also had an injury before the Smith fight so I think he has been a little bit injury prone as of recent so you know with that mixing in with his age as well that might be playing a little bit of a factor and you know of course Bivol he's worked very diff very hard very very much so to get to his position in which he's at he's not really been given opportunities quite so early on as I suppose Baterbiev was given. Bivol was on a big platform with Matchroom had to fight like the, the Craig Richard fight and you know it was perhaps a bit of a tough one but didn't where well, he didn't look his best but then was given a Canelo fight in which he was kind of expected to lose pretty much was expected to lose of course Canelo moving up in weight was always going to be a tough test for Canelo in the first place but he really shined Bivol he really shined and really put on a, an excellent performance there and showed so much discipline so much just pure skill and fight IQ and that's kind of then led him on to now to be going down the route in which he's gone down to now get to here and you know in my opinion he has fought the better fighters out of the two I mean he's fought Canelo he's fought Joe Smith Jr I know he's not really a huge name but he's you know that's one of the bigger names in which what Baterbiev has and he's also fought Zeda Ramirez as well plus you know the likes of Zinad and Lyndon Arthur and you know a few of a relatively uh, big but not quite top world level fighters but then you know you compare that to Baterbiev arguably the biggest names he's kind of got on his record was probably Callum Smith if not you know Anthony Yard, Vosdick, of course, like I say, Joe Smith Jr., but they're nowhere near the names of the likes of uh, Azela Ramirez, who, of course, is doing great things himself and is on the, the next Riyadh season card, being that uh, a fight versus uh, Billam Smith. And then, you know, of course, Canelo, everybody knows Canelo, pound for pound, one of the best. So if Bivol is to manage to get a win here, he is arguably beaten two of the pound for pound best fighters around. You know, there's only really kind of Usyk, I suppose he could even fight left in the pound for pound rankings, um, but you know that would just really, I think, perhaps cement himself in like a a fourth kind of spot. I think in the pound for pound rankings, from my personal opinion. Uh, but you know, Baterbiev, if he's able to beat Bivol, then it, you know it's the same kind of thing there as well. So it's a fight which, like I say, on paper is a true fifty fifty matchup. There isn't realistically many of them in boxing, and you know when you think about it, there probably isn't. There's really not that many. I mean, even if you fought Fury versus Usyk the first time, was that now that the first time's played out, the rematch on paper isn't really a 50-50 anymore because, of course, Usyk's already had the one-up against Fury. So, like I said, there isn't really many true world-level 50-50 fights left. And this is what Riyadh season has made. It's made another top-level fight where all the belts are on the line, the best versus the best, and that's always what you wanted to be seeing. And, you know, Baterbiev... 
has shown little bits of, I suppose, vulnerability in the past. You know, that's the, the main thing in which a lot of people have talked about coming into this fight, and that's, of course, he has been dropped before. Perhaps that shows that he can show a bit of, you know, he can face adversity and be able to deal with that better than perhaps what we've seen from Bivol. Bivol hasn't really had to deal with that. But, like I say, that does show perhaps that little bit more vulnerability in the game of Baturbia. And I think defensively, Bivol is much stronger than that of Baturbia, but Baturbia might be stronger at, at offensively than that of Bivol. So, you know, like I say, it's a, it's difficult to be able to kind of weigh up the differences between the two fighters because I, I do believe they are pretty different fighters and I think they are going to have two stars that are going to gel. You don't really want two fighters that are, you know, go to the best versus the best that do have that kind of similar type of style and Baturbia Bivol I really don't believe is so. That is so and... Of course, everybody talks about Baturbia's power. He has that higher level of testosterone where he is able to, you know, have this amount of power, this crazy amount of power, and to be able to just keep going like he is. And, I mean, people have resorted to saying that drugs, prob uh, drugs cheats and things like that is what he's doing and things like that to be able to be as powerful and be as strong as he is. But I do genuinely just think I think that's just that nat natural higher testosterone which in which he seems to have in him and so yeah it's crazy but I think a lot of people are also writing off other things in which Baturbiev does well I'm going to speak a bit more about that in just a moment but obviously the power is the main thing in which everybody talks about I just don't necessarily know if that's you know the only thing you should be talking about for Baturbiev um, but you know like I say also on this card I'm going to go through a, a few of the a few of the big fights there are you know, it's another excellent card. It's sad to see the um, Shakur Stevenson versus Joe Cordina fight isn't on it. I thought that would have probably been a relatively good fight. Um, it would have also just been nice to see Shakur Stevenson be on one of the Riyadh season cards. But, you know, hopefully we'll be able to see that happen soon. Will it be against Joe Cordina? We'll see. Maybe he will be wanting to wait because that might be one of the only bigger opportunity in which, uh, opportunities in which Joe Cordina has available to him at the moment. But, it, like you know, like I say, we'll have to wait and see if he is willing to wait or not. And, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens with Shakur Stevenson because obviously he's just some match room. They have the likes of, you know, a Devin Haney that could make sense for a fight or things like that. But if you think about, like, a Javante Davis, a Lomachenko, Lomachenko seems to want to have time out. Javante Davis doesn't seem to relatively be too eager to be working with Riyadh seasons, so it's there. There, there are still limited options for that of uh, Shakur Stevenson, unless he fights like a, a Williams or Pedro, but that's a, a fight in which has a lot of risk and not too much reward realistically for Stevenson. Uh, but like I said, to speak about the fights that are on this card, you know the one fight in which I'm not really going to speak about is uh, Ben Whitaker versus uh, Liam Cameron. You know, it's a it's a very good contest, but. I think perhaps it's going to be comfortable for Ben Whitaker and you know it's great to see Liam Cameron be put on this show he's worked so hard to be in the position in which he's in and like I say it's excellent to see but I would be shocked to see if Ben Whitaker isn't able to make relatively easy work um, of Liam Cameron. Of course Liam Cameron put up a very good showing against Lyndon Arthur but I just think with the style in which Ben Whitaker has, it would be comfortable. It should be comfortable with the movement in which he has to be able to see things coming from Cameron and then be able to win from that. Uh, but to speak more about the fights in which are the uh, world title fights and uh, also all the, the big, big fights. <laughs> and uh, So we'll start off with uh, Nicholson versus Chapman for the WBC World Featherweight title. Uh, it's a great contest. It's the first, of course, Riyadh season women's fights and that's creating the history in itself and it's it's great to see that that is finally being happened uh, finally being made obviously this was talked about happening on the 5v5 but obviously it didn't so it's been a little bit of a delay a little bit of a wait Nicholson has been looking pretty good as a recent she's been I think developing she's been improving and as a world champion I still believe she is improving with every fight and has been looking very good so far defending her belt multiple times now Chapman hasn't perhaps been quite as as active as as busy as she wants but she's been looking very uh, aggressive very good in the same time as well it is a complete different styles uh, between the two of these two fighters Nicholson is a lot more of a, a puncher mover don't get into too much of a firefight and things like that and she's a clean boxer a lot of the time whereas Chapman kind of wants to try and get in your face and is going to try and still get out and brawl out but also can move uh, relatively well as well if she wants to um, 
I'm going to say that Chapman's going to win via majority decision. Perhaps that's a bit of a, a bold statement to say, but I think if it goes into the later rounds and Nicholson being perhaps as predictable as what she can sometimes be, I think Chapman will, is relatively good at cutting off the ring when she wants to be, and I think she can get in close at times, rough her up. If Nicholson gets roughed up at any point in a round, I don't necessarily think she's had to deal with that yet. So I think she might struggle a bit and think Chapman might be able to have success from there. But I think the earlier rounds to, could definitely go to Nicholson. It's just the mid to late rounds where I could see Chapman getting closer, getting closer, wearing her down slowly and then be able to have success. Because like I said, Nicholson is a good clean boxer, but a lot of the time she will just kind of push you and then move around and push you and move around. It can become a little bit predictable at times. And if Chapman can begin to read that, I think she is higher level opposition in which the opposition Nicholson has fought so far. Obviously, uh, Chapman hasn't fought anywhere near the kind of level in which Nicholson has fought so far. But like I said, I think Chapman could definitely cause an upset. I think it would be a close fight and perhaps we could see a rematch again. But yet again, I'm going to say that uh, a Queensbury fighter are going to be a matchroom fighter. And it's been consistent now this being the case and I mean in the Riyadh season fight so far it hasn't not been the case obviously they won all the 5v5 they also of course just won Joshua versus Dubois with Dubois winning as well so it's really not looking good matching versus Queensbury but I'm going to say that that kind of pattern continues for now and like I say Chapman by majority decision uh, then we move on to Eubank Jr versus uh, Cesar Menta and this is for the RBO World uh, middleweight title and uh, you know it's an interesting contest it's a fight in which not many people know too much about Saramenta obviously he fought Golovkin got absolutely destroyed versus Golovkin fought Munguia did a little bit better but still was beaten convincingly and has had successes out in Poland he's on a, a relatively decent winning streak after them back-to-back -back defeats in which he did suffer but, you know, it's seen as a, a bit of a comeback fight, a bit of a, a keep busy fight for Eubank Jr. It's seen as a kind of introduction of him onto the Riyadh season shows. And it's interesting to see because a lot of the fighters in which we've seen so far on these Riyadh season shows haven't necessarily had to come and have a warm-up fight and had to, you know, introduce themselves. They have been kind of thrown into a big fight. And if you compare it to the likes of like a Liam Smith, Liam Smith was going to jump into a really tough fight versus Josh Kelly and perhaps that was because there wasn't many options there for him but I don't know I think that Juventus Junior is getting it given a little bit easier to him because of what's happened well because he wants to basically and he doesn't necessarily want to get thrown into a really big fight straight away he is still perhaps a bit vulnerable after the loss versus Liam Smith. Obviously, he went and avenged that and avenged that really well, put on an excellent performance. Liam Smith did look very poor in that last fight, but he came and put on a really sharp performance where a lot of his accurate uh, work was being shown and he was looking excellent. He had a, an excellent jab as well. And I think, like I say, it was a very good performance from him. But it's an interesting fight to be made. And, I mean, Juventus Jr. of course has come and caused a bit of a ruckus and said a lot of things in the press conference to get eyes onto this fight team and though, you know, like I say, nobody really knows who his opponent is. He's very good at that. He's always been very good at that. He's always been kind of known as that showman who is able to get eyes upon him and he's done that again, calling out all of the promoters, saying that they're all this, that and the other and thrown out accusations and things like that obviously he had to retract that statement that's not really surprising at all but nonetheless it's going to be interesting to see what version we get of Eubank Jr perhaps he could be overlooking Saramanta Saramanta perhaps could have success at times but I think he's going to be much slower not able to find the range not able to keep up with Eubank Jr and I think Eubank Jr is going to win via TKO in round 7. I think it's going to be a very comfortable realistic league performance for Eubank Jr. At least it should be, or in my opinion it should be. If it's not, then I think there will be a poor performance from Eubank Jr. if anything. Um, but then, you know, then he can move on. Hopefully we could see like a, a Billy Joe Saunders rematch. I think that would be a great fight. You know, there's talks of him fighting Canelo in May. There's not really loads of options there for Canelo at the moment unless Canelo wants to fight like a, an Umbili or wants to join Riyadh season and kind of get involved with that but like I said I don't think there's many options for Canelo so perhaps we could see Ben Jr in there next with him um, 
But, like I say, for now, I think it's going to be a, a comfortable win for him. And, like I say, getting his eyes back onto the... Um, well, getting the eyes back onto the big boxing scene. And I'm sure his post-fight interview thing will be entertaining, if anything. And probably, like I say, the thing that's most exciting to look out for for this fight. Uh, moving on to Wardley versus Clark 2. Of course... Uh, this was an amazing fight the first time round. I believe it is still for the British heavyweight title uh, this time round. But like I say, it was for it was an amazing fight last time, and uh, it was a, a back and forth contest. One of them fights in which uh, was a boxing rivalry in which it was kind of needed, I think. And there hadn't been too many kind of huge boxing rivalries as of recent in the in the UK. And yeah, I think this was, especially for a heavyweight one as well, was really needed. And of course, Wardley dropped Clark. Clark showed a lot of heart to be able to get up. Perhaps it wasn't the most, you know, highest of level of boxing displays. Wardley being quite sloppy at times with some of his work and being quite wide with the shots. And Clark taking a lot of punishment, perhaps not really moving the best. But having success with a, with a beautiful uppercut and having good spells in which he was looking like he was showing some real good technical ability, technical ability higher than that of Wardley's throughout. And Wardley showed a lot of heart, had a busted up nose and really had to push through that. And going into this second fight, I'm going to say that Clark's going to win via TKO in round 11. Both fighters were absolutely knackered at the end of the first fight. And that's no real surprise realistically because of how high the tempo it was. And I mean, realistically, they are both quite big guys. So perhaps don't have the best of conditioning and they did you know both look like they're giving their absolute all for it which is you know what you want to see and that's what made the fight ever so entertaining but Clark was able to put it on Wardley into them later rounds and that's where a lot of the rounds in which he won and when you know obviously he got the point deduction he was still looking good and perhaps if he didn't have got the point deduction he may have won and I think it will be a very tough test again. I think Clark's just boxing will be superior. I don't necessarily know if Wardley is going to be able to take as many shots in which he did in the first fight and really be able to push through like he did. Perhaps he will be able to, and uh, you know we could see that happen again. But I think if Clark keeps timing him with the, the uppercut in which he was landing, he could definitely, like I say, get him out of there. And if he doesn't get dropped early, if he can settle into the fight a bit nicer into the earlier rounds. I think he could have that boxing ability higher uh, than Wardley to be able to get him out of there into the round 11. You know, there was a lot of question marks going into the first fight if, if if Clark was ready for that fight and the fights beforehand, perhaps he didn't really look too amazing. But he did show a lot and I, he's personally changed my opinion. You know, I was one of the people that think Wardley would be able to beat Clark relatively comfortably. But... Clark, like I say, in my opinion, he changed and showed a lot into that into that second fight, into that first fight. I mean, and coming into this one, I believe he's going to win. Like I say, late stoppage for Clark. I think it's going to be another amazing contest as well. Um, but yeah, late stoppage for Clark, and then he could go on to, I don't know necessarily after that. It'd be interesting. I think the gap between the the British level heavyweight scene and then the world level heavyweight scene is an interesting gap at the moment because. If you kind of think who's in between that, perhaps like a Derek Chisora is and maybe it, maybe a Joe Joyce is, but I don't even rate Joe Joyce anymore. Joe Joyce might be fighting Yoka and that's not really, a, that's lower than British level fight in my opinion. And Chisora is probably going to fight Dillian White. So it's, it's interesting to see who, who he could go up against in the heavyweight scene, like I say. If, because he's, he's not going to be able to go straight from that fight to them to be able to jump into a world level fight. It'll be interesting to see. Uh, and then the, the last fight in which I want to speak about from the undercard is Optai versus Massey for the IBF World Cruiserweight title. Uh, it's a bit of a surprising matchup this one to be honest. I didn't think that Massey was going to get this opportunity to fight Optai. Obviously he's coming off a, a good performance versus Chamberlain. It was a relatively close fight at times. Chamberlain had success and Massey had to really push through. And you know it was one of the fights in which at the end they were both kind of thinking that they won. Um, but that is at British level, and now he's been thrown into a fighter against Opatia, who's just beaten Marius Bradis for the second time in a, another very, very entertaining fight. I wouldn't even mind seeing a third fight of that. Marius Bradis is always going to be so tough, so durable. Even at like 39 years of age, I believe he is. He still showed so much, and 
Obataya was just, like I said, that younger fighter who was able to give a bit more, have success into the early sort of mid rounds, and you know he did struggle a little bit in, into the later rounds, and did perhaps get hurt a little bit and uh, have to cling on a bit at times into them later rounds. But Massey, I, I, I think he has, you know, he showed that he can fight at a high level in these cause the likes of Joe Parker problems at times in their fights, but. And I, I fully respect him for taking this opportunity. He's, he's always kind of been the one who's taken opportunities when other opponents haven't. I mean, if you look back in his career, I mean, Richard Riakpour, that fight for him came and was a very tough fight to take for him. It was so early on in his career and he hadn't even really been tested before that. And then to go in and fight something like a Re Richard Riakpour when he was 10-0, and 0. it was a very uh, tough contest to take, but of course he didn't end up winning that one, and then the, you know, the Joe Parker one was a fight in which was quite surprising to see at heavyweight, a, fight, a weight in which he'd never fought at before, and he took that opportunity then, and even Chamberlain, he was the underdog coming into that, and you know, Chamberlain was on a great run of form and things like that, so it was another tough fight he had to take, and now Taya is another very tough test he has to take, but... I think Obataya is the best cruiserweight around, in my opinion, at the moment. I think his movement is amazing. I think the pick, the shot selection is amazing. I think he's probably learned a lot more from that that, that second fight versus Briadis and is going to probably come in even more developed. I also think he's shown that he isn't going to overlook an opponent. I think he showed that versus Thompson. I think he showed that versus... Uh, Zorro as well he didn't overlook either of them when he easily could have and yeah I think he's going to be able to win via KO in round four I think it's going to be a statement win obviously Massey is seen as this tough durable guy and didn't get stopped versus the likes of a Joseph Parker but I think Opataya at this weight in the form he's in at the moment is looking pretty indestructible and I think yeah Massey won't be able to take as many shots in which he took versus Chamberlain take that many versus Optai and I don't think he's going to be able to do that uh, and get away with it and so yeah Optai I'm going to say work via KO in round four and then going back to the main event and you know when it sees fights I always try and list through as many good things and uh, you know a few negatives in which I've seen and things like that because I don't believe any fight is ever perfect but I do feel like I always miss certain good things because there is just so much about these fighters that are good because they are pound for pound some of the best fighters or both of these clearly are pound for pound two of the best fighters. Uh, but, you know, we'll start off with Baturbiev, who, of course, has that crazy amounts of power and uh, has been shown multiple times now where he is able to flip the script, land the shot, even if things aren't going well for him, and then be able to just completely brutalise you. And in general, that makes you uh, scared of him, pretty much. And I don't think Bivol is going to be scared of him. I don't think he's going to fear him. He didn't seem to fear Canelo at all and boxed with a perfect game plan versus him. And... He didn't seem to question himself versus Canelo, in which a lot of people do. And I just don't see that he's going to be able to scare Beterbi. Uh, Beterbi going to be able to scare Bivol. I don't see that's going to be able to be the case. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out because I think Beterbi is getting to a point now where he is kind of used to his opponents fearing him a little bit coming into the fight. And that's where he can, you know, straight away go onto the front foot and have success because his opponent is questioning himself and not too sure what to expect from uh, Baturbiev and I think even against Anthony Yard, Yard was hurt and you know he was having a lot of success and he was hurt but as soon as he got really hurt into that 7th 8th round even his corner was like no because they knew what was going to come afterwards, they knew that they wouldn't be able to keep up with that, perhaps if that was Anthony Yard getting hurt versus somebody a bit lesser with lesser power they might have their team might have let him carry on a little bit more i don't necessarily know but he, they looked like they wanted to get him out of there straight away even if yard didn't want to leave straight away perhaps that shows like i said that scare factor about him uh, but of course you know he's a pressure fighter he has so much aggression in his game so much just kind of will to come forwards and to just tear you, tear you apart. He closes the distance very well, I think, from that high tight guard in which he has, he is able to close the distance very well. Um, he doesn't let you off the ropes if he has you on the ropes. He is very punishing. He's very good at cutting off the rope at the ring as well and just breaking you down, wearing you down, beating you down a lot of the time with them just fudding, fudding shots. And, you know, he is one of them athletes in which ha does have crazy amounts of power and but opponents just can't seem to deal with that. If you can compare that to like a, if you go into the UFC, compare that to like an Alex Pereira at the moment, opponents are just fearful of him and 
just because of that thudding power which you can even just hear through watching him on the telly it's it's crazy to hear uh, he has that high output and he can fight at a very good work rate. I believe both fighters are very well conditioned. They're very much used to going into the 12 round distance if needs be. Even though Baturbiev hasn't ever gone the whole distance, he is able to go that distance if needs be. And I believe, you know, he has that high output which he can manage throughout the fight. He's composed a lot of the time. Everything is so calculated. All of his work is so calculated that he's very composed, very relaxed. He doesn't load up on his shots whenever he does land. It's very efficient work. He can fight at an in-close or at a mid-range. He punches pretty much everywhere and forces his shots through your guard a lot of the time. He's not reactive, so in that aspect, he doesn't really react to feints at all. And Bivol perhaps could issue feints a bit at times, but I just don't think Baturbio is going to bite onto them. He imposes himself and he has got very good timing as well. He can fight on the back foot Baturbio if needs be and can time you with very good shots and he's shown that he can do that as well. Negatives about him, I think his footwork at times can be a bit off. I think his balance can be a bit off and he can stand straight on and then look a little bit wobbly with footwork if he does get caught with shots and that is something in which Bivol has superior to him I believe. His defensive movement is sometimes good, he is able to move, but I don't think his head movement is anything excellent and he can kind of keep his chin and back up with his head like this because, and that's where, well, I mean not because, because that is where he's able to get caught with shots at times. Uh, he doesn't like taking shots, you know, no fighter likes taking shots, but you can, see, you can see that there is that clear frustration in him if he is consistently taking shots, you can see that he is getting a bit more annoyed every time he is. Uh, his accuracy at times can be a little bit off. Like I say, he's very calculated with his work. And when he's on the front foot, a lot of the time he isn't really missing too much. And he is throwing nice calculated shots. And if he has you hurt, he's not rushing to get you out. But I think sometimes if he is on the back foot, his accuracy can be a little bit off at times. Um, sometimes he would take to give shots. He can get tangled up a little bit in close at times. Can walk you onto shot, or can be walked onto shots, I mean. Uh, has that lesser speed, I believe, out of the two. He can be moved by punches as well and has been shown that he can be kind of rotated, spin around, spun around by punches and Bivol, like I say, is somebody who is able to move very well so he could perhaps move, keep moving, keep better, keep Baturbia moving around the ring and just keep picking his shots and going around the ring that way. Uh, and Sometimes he does forget to use his jab, even though it's a very good jab, he's using it at times. Uh, Bivol, as a fighter, he is very disciplined. And I've mentioned that multiple times now. He is very disciplined. He has that Soviet type style, which is an in and out type style with an excellent jab. He's not really getting drawn into a fight unless he knows wholeheartedly that he is able to fully beat you through. Perhaps in that last fight versus Zinad, he was that bit more aggressive than what we have often seen versus, uh, from Bivol. He, he knew that he was levels above his opponents and knew that that big fight versus Baturbiev was there and instead of kind of cruising through the fight he really wanted to put on a statement and put on a show which I have a lot of respect for and perhaps he was a bit more aggressive in that one but typically you know in the big fight at big occasions like like say that versus Canelo he was a lot very very disciplined very very defensively locked in in which he is a lot of the time he's very fast he has great range management he's got great accuracy at, t at all the time as well and finds openings finds gaps very well uh, his timing is also excellent he's very composed as well both fighters are very composed very relaxed able to pick their shots pick their work he's got a high guard similar to that of Baturbiev high strong guard but is Baturbiev going to be able to break through that we'll have to wait and see uh, he's got them straight shot combinations which are excellent to see just like I say, unloading straight shots over and over again, really being able to find the openings and beat you down from that way. His balance is excellent. He counters very well as well. He changes levels well. He has excellent fight IQ. I think better fight IQ than that of Baturbiev. I think Baturbiev is calculated in his work and calculated in the shots in which he throws. But I think Bivol has a, a general better fight IQ where he's able to kind of judge how the fight is going and judge what he has to do perhaps a little bit better than that of Baturbiev. He finds openings, like I say, very well. He has great work rate as well. Uh, punches uh, back. He can punch on the back foot and things like that are necessary as well. And he can fight on the front or the back foot. Uh, negatives about him, I think he can sometimes move into them straight line movements and back and forth type movements. You know, it's an in and out type style, but perhaps it can become a little bit predictable at times if he can, or if he could, you know, if he's moving back and forth and Baturbiev gets him up against the ropes, then he's going to have to circle out and can't just always be going in and out. 
his head could sometimes be on the line as well, similar to that of uh, Baturbiev. He can wait a bit too long to be able to pick his shots and then sometimes can get caught with shots of his own, but typically does then respond with excellent work himself. Uh, is in close extending uh, of shots. Sometimes he's overextending his shots when he is in close because he's so used to fighting an excellent mid-range. When he does get in close, he's overextending the, them straight shots in which he throws. Uh, fully committing to his work as well. Sometimes gaining the respect of his opponents. Is he going to be able to gain the respect of Baturbia? That's probably one of the biggest questions we're going to have to ask. If he isn't, then is Baturbia going to have, be able to have success from that? Uh, throwing various shots you know he's got very good straight shots and we'll change levels so it's not predictable but sometimes throwing an uppercut and varying the angles in which he's throwing the shots can sometimes be a little bit of a problem of his and if Baturbiev is on the back foot and is just taking a lot of the same shots and catching them all with his tight guard he will respond with an overhand and he will try and hurt you with that and he will try and then spin off you with that even if he is on the back foot and even if he is perhaps hurt he's shown that he will do that so perhaps if Bivol varies the angles a little bit more he might be able to have more success with the tight guard in which Baturbiev has. Bivol is the favourite for this fight and I think that Bivol is going to win via unanimous decision. I think it's going to be an excellent contest. I believe that Bivol is going to have to stick to a very, very strict game plan and Baturbiev perhaps will get frustrated into the later rounds and perhaps if it does go into the 11th to 12th rounds, it could be a really, really entertaining contest because Baturbiev, I would believe, will just throw everything at it, at it to be able to get him out. But I think Bivol is going to be able to just be the guy to be able to frustrate Baturbiev and be able to throw them mid, uh, them straight shot combinations, be able to land some of them with the with Baturbiev had been on the line a little bit at times. And if he gets monster the back foot, have a little bit of success, but then be able to move out and rotate round and keep that discipline that he always shows. And that's where I think, like I say, Baturbi, I mean, Bivol will win by unanimous decision. Doesn't have to make the fight entertaining, can leave Baturbiev to try and do that and just box to what he knows he can do and know how to do. And like I said, I don't think he's going to be fearful of that of Baturbiev, so I don't think he's going to be giving him too much respect. Then who we could go on to fight, obviously Baturbiev again could be another great option. When it is for all the belts, we do often see them rematch clauses be made, so perhaps we will see it happen again. And if it is a great fight, then we'll probably want to see it happen again. If not, the light heavyweight division is in an interesting position right now. I mean, the likes of Benavidez, the likes of... Uh, uh, I forgot his name as well. There's a there's another fighter who's moved up as well. Uh, so you know there are other names around available at the moment. But I mean, uh, Morel. Sorry, my bad. So Benavidez, Morel, they moved up. Morel definitely isn't realistically ready for a, a Bivol fight, in my opinion. Benavidez, perhaps that could be an option. Um, but he's seemingly struggling around trying to get good opponents because there are realistically only four names in the light heavyweight division at the moment. Baturbiev, Bivol, Morel and Benavides. So there isn't really loads going on. So if Bivol wants the huge fights, then he could go on to fight somebody like the winner of a, the Optai versus Massey fight. Realistically, if Massey does win, I don't think he will fight Massey but, because there probably will be a rematch between the two of Optai and Massey. But if Optai wins, then that could be a fight there to be made. So, you know, like I say, it's interesting to see what could happen. You know, the Canelo rematch could still be there as well. So I'm not really too sure what would happen uh, with the winner of this fight. But nonetheless, it's an excellent fight. I can't wait to watch it. And I hope you have enjoyed this video. Like If you didn't, you like this, subscribe if you're new. And thanks for watching.